On a sunny afternoon in Hawaii, a Boeing 737 is climbing to its cruising altitude on a short island hopping flight to Honolulu. But suddenly the piece is disturbed by a loud bang, as a large part of the aircraft breaks away. Now the pilots struggle to land the stricken plane at the closest available airport. Will they make it and what caused the strange incident? Find out with me today and subscribe right now so you won't miss any future episodes. Let's get into it. Welcome to airspace. On April 28, 1988, passengers were boarding Aloha Airlines Flight 243 at Hilo International Airport, Hawaii. Among them was a passenger called Gail Yamamoto, who, when she entered the plane, noticed a crack in the fuselage, but thought nothing of it and did not tell anybody. The boarding process of the 89 passengers was soon completed and Aloha 243 left the ground for its 45-minute trip to Honolulu. The Boeing 737 enjoyed a steady, normal climb to 24,000 feet. But suddenly and violently, a loud bang and a whooshing sound occurred, as something happened that was up to that date completely unheard of. An entire section of the airplane's outer skin departed the aircraft. The plane was still flying and not falling from the sky, but over a length of 18 feet, passengers found themselves high up in the air, sitting in an aircraft that no longer had an outer skin. Immediately, the captain took control and initiated an emergency descent. He stated later that the plane rolled left and right and the controls felt slow and sluggish. Quickly, everyone who still had one donned their oxygen masks. The captain later stated that he could not believe what he was seeing. When he looked back to the cabin, he only saw blue sky where the cabin roof had one spin. An emergency was declared and the flight crew began the diversion to Maui, about halfway between Hilo and Honolulu. Communications were very difficult, since the jet engines and the rush of air now engulfed every other sound, so the pilots initially just communicated using hand signals. The pilots tried to explain their situation to air traffic control, but to no avail. Apparently, the controller realized that a decompression had happened, but did not realize how serious the situation really was. When the pilots had successfully descended the 737 to 10,000 feet, where the air is dense enough to breathe, they removed their oxygen masks and slowed the plane down. This finally permitted them to communicate properly, as the rush of air was no longer deafening. The captain lined the plane up for landing on runway 02 in Maui and the first officer started descending the flaps at the captain's command. But when the captain realized that this made the plane even more sluggish to control, he decided to land with just a minimal flap setting and he kept a higher speed. But their share of misfortune did not run out there. Just some moments later, one of the two engines failed as well. Debris from the cabin roof had been thrown into the engine intake earlier and the engine had ground itself up sufficiently to fail. Still, the other engine provided thrust, and the landing with just one engine is perfectly doable, so they continued. When the pilots finally lowered the landing gear, the two main gears extended normally, but the green light that indicates the correct extension of the nose wheel did not illuminate. The pilots tried the alternate extension method as well, but the light would not come on. The 737s at that time also had an inspection glass in the cockpit floor, through which it was possible to see whether the nose gear had properly extended, but it was obstructed by an air traffic controller who was traveling as a passenger on the jump seat in the cockpit. Instead of delaying the approach further, the captain decided to just go for it and possibly land without the nose gear. He was confident that it had properly extended, since the red light warning of unsafe landing gear condition was not on. And if it hadn't extended, it is still possible to settle the 737 down on its nose after landing without the nose gear. The plane eventually touched down normally, with all gear struts firmly in place. The captain stopped the plane on the runway and ordered everyone to evacuate the aircraft. During this time, these unbelievable pictures were taken. Imagine how the passengers must have felt during their wild ride. It is amazing that this plane landed considering the very substantial damage it suffered. During the evacuation, the airport of Maui realized that it had not been prepared for such an emergency and not enough emergency services were in attendance. Instead, a local tour operator sent vans to bring the injured to the hospital on the island. After everyone had evacuated, passengers were counted and miraculously, every passenger seemed to be accounted for. All passengers were seated and wearing their seatbelts at the time of the explosive decompression, but a sad reality soon dawned on everyone concerned. 58-year-old flight attendant Clarabel Lansing, who had worked as a flight attendant for 37 years, was sucked out of the aircraft when cabin pressure was violently released. She had been standing in the section concerned just as the failure happened. A search for her body and the missing aircraft fuselage part was initiated immediately, but neither have ever been found. 
The United States National Transportation Safety Board was tasked with the investigation of the accident suffered by Aloha Airlines Flight 243. Investigators examined the service history of the 737 and discovered that it had been used during an astonishing 89,680 flights, but had only accumulated 35,500 flight hours. This puts the average flight duration for this plane at just about 24 minutes per flight. Since Aloha Airlines mostly operated short island hopping flights within Hawaii, this unusual accumulation of short flights was achieved. This kind of usage pattern put a lot of stress on the fuselage material, since flying many flights also means that the fuselage had to go through many cycles of being pressurized and depressurized as it climbed and descended. This weakened the fuselage metal and multiple fatigue cracks formed over time. One of these cracks was observed by passenger Gail Yamamoto. The NTSB finally concluded that flight 243 had just been the straw that broke the camel's back. As the cabin pressure rose for one last time, a weakened metal seam tore open and the cabin pressure was released violently, ripping the fuselage open along other preformed cracks. Apparently, the cracking of the fuselage was not recognized by Aloha Airlines maintenance personnel, partly due to the fact that examinations for such cracks were usually done during nighttime. Furthermore, the NTSB concluded that Aloha Airlines management had failed to properly supervise its maintenance department and that the United States Federal Aviation Administration had not propagated a warning by Boeing, who had already realized that particular kinds of seams in fuselage metal were prone to failure. Also, the high amount of accumulated flight cycles was not originally intended by Boeing, who had planned for the 737 type to be used on about 40,000 flights. The nose landing gear system was also inspected since the pilots reported that they had been unsure whether the nose gear had properly extended. Soon the culprit for the absence of the green downlock light was found. The respective indicator bulb had simply burned out. The accident aircraft was obviously damaged beyond economic repair and was dismantled on site. Aloha Airlines continued to fly for another 20 years until it filed for bankruptcy in March 2008 after 62 years of existence. Today, other carriers such as Hawaiian or United Airlines operate the inter-Hawaiian routes. More stringent fuselage inspections are now mandatory. Thank you very much for watching. I hope you liked this week's video. Make sure to subscribe so you won't miss any future episodes. See you next week.